Well, hello there, ladies and gents. Here I am sipping on my Four Sigmatic coffee. Good stuff. All right. So first of all, I got a lot of really positive feedback about the last vlog tutorial thing I did in this setting talking about uh, sustainability of dieting and how to make it that sustainable. I really like doing those kind of educational um, tutorial videos. I feel like it's just concise, it's to the point, it's informative. So I'm definitely, definitely, definitely going to be doing more of those. Thank you so much for the feedback and thank you for watching it. Today, I have procured my presentation from KetoCon this year. So a lot of you have seen my last year's presentation, which was recorded on my camera, which was far away from the audience or far away from the stage and just not a really super quality video. This one is from their cameras, so it's much, much better. Um, so without further ado, let's dive in and watch this year's presentation of my KetoCon speech. Um, by the way, huge shout out to KetoCon. Let me just plug them real quick. They're freaking awesome. Uh, the Keto Evangelist team, Brian and the whole crew behind them, like, thank you so much for even giving me the opportunity to speak. Everything was awesome. Have no complaints whatsoever. Um, keep making waves, y'all, because you're doing it right, and you're building a crazy following behind you and influencing a lot of people for the better. So, huge shout out to Keto Evangelist. Um, now, let's dig into my KetoCon speech. So I'm Robert Sykes, Keto Savage. Uh, again, I got a couple head counts of who all was here last year. But I'm going to do kind of like a little intro to me for those of you that do not know me. Um, viewer discretion advised on these next couple images, so keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to start with my pre-bodybuilding endeavors, kind of the evolution of myself. Whoa, look at that. <laughs> so... so so this is me when I started bodybuilding. I started about eight years ago or so. And like most people that first, you know, want to get into lifting, I was watching all the YouTube videos. That's how I learned how to work out, watching people on YouTube, all the pro bodybuilders. <laughs> what they did seemed to work, so I must follow suit and do what they do. And I was young and dumb, as the caption indicates here. There's a lot of bro science in the bodybuilding community, a lot of um, misinformed individuals, and I was one of them. But... One of the, the pieces of advice I'd always get was you got to eat big to get big. So I did. I got really, really big. I got fat and happy. And uh, I was 230 pounds here. So I started that previous picture. I was 115 pounds. This was 230 pounds. And to achieve this look, you eat a lot of food. I was eating 6,000 calories a day. Um, you know those, those macho, microwavable macho chimichangas you see? Um, that's what I was eating. It was not keto. I was not keto. This is pre-keto. Um, but I would eat that. I'd eat like all the microwavable baked foods. I was just terrible. Ramen noodles. I was in college at the time. I was eating ramen noodles and tuna, canned tuna. And I was up to 230 pounds, 28.5% body fat. And I was delusional because I thought I was jacked. This is not jacked, y'all. That's jacked up on fat. Um, <laughs> So this is not a good look either. And again, I was still under the delusion of what I'd been told from you know my peers in the gym. People think they know what they're talking about. Take you under their wing. Don't be under their wing. Um, so again, under their wing, I, I decided to do my first competition. And this was in my sophomore year of college. And I went from, from this to this in three months. And I lost 70 pounds. I was 150 there, roughly whatever that math breaks down to. Uh, 150 pounds and 70 pounds lost in three months. And that sounds impressive, but it's not because I was so incredibly malnourished. Um, I'm going to get morbid with y'all here for a second. I didn't know what I was doing, and I just cut calories. I followed traditional bro dieting. I was living on chicken and rice and tuna with a side of broccoli. And I just kept cutting calories and kept cutting calories. I got down, I think at one point I was like sub 1,100 calories. Um, and I lost my love for training to do this. Like I literally was in the gym and what motivated me to get through a set or a rep scheme was visualizing somebody holding a gun to my parents head and saying, if you don't give me everything you have, I'm going to put a bullet between the rhymes. That's literally what ran through my mind when I was here. Because I was so malnourished, I was so depleted, and I just hated where I was at. Was not happy, was not healthy. 
And that's the thought process that I was going through in order to compete and look like this. And no competitors have to do that. So after this competition, which I did really well, I won my, my division, but it was just wrong. It was unhealthy. After this competition, since I had restricted my calories for so long, so dramatically, I developed a bunch of eating disorders. Um, I got, I would binge eat. I literally went into IHOP one day and ordered every pancake variety on the menu. That's the International House of Pancakes. There's a bunch of pancakes, you know, and uh, it, it, was, it was not good. I would eat so much. I would eat 10,000 calories in a meal. I would eat a sleeve of saltine crackers and an entire jar of Jiffy. And then I would realize what I had done. I, I don't know why I didn't realize it while I was doing it, but I realized it after the fact and feel so bad because I'd worked so hard for this, and yet I didn't have the mental fortitude to stay on top of things. And that's when I developed those eating disorders. And I got, you know, I would binge eat 20,000 calories a day, and then I would force myself to puke, and then I would eat nothing but a can of tuna for the next three days. And it was just not a healthy lifestyle, which is sad because as bodybuilders were trying to like illustrate a healthy lifestyle, it was the farthest thing from it. So I did this style of bodybuilding and dieting for the next three years. I did two other shows following traditional bro dieting, you know, like the whole keep protein really high, keep carbs high, and then taper those down and keep fat at nothing. And then after my third show, I realized, because I hadn't fixed the eating disorders, nothing was going right, so I decided to try something called carbohydrate backloading, which is a John Kiefer's protocol. I don't know if you're all familiar with that. Basically, it's keto during the first half of the day, and then high glycemic index carbs, carb loading at night. And I noticed that I felt better before I ever introduced the carbs. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to do carb backloading without the carbs. That sounds reasonable. Um, and then I, lo and behold, that, that became keto. That's what I realized I was doing. It was keto, and then I kind of went down the keto rabbit hole, did my next competition, and then here I am, keto, looking leaner, much more healthy, much more stabilized hormones, metabolism, much more sustainable way of eating. And let me go on a little rant here about competitive bodybuilding and like the natural sphere, especially I compete as a natural athlete. So many people, it's, it's dangerous. I'm excited about keto tapping into that niche because it's just the right way to do it. Like most competitors, I'm literally competing against people who cut their water. There was one guy who had to walk off stage because he was cramping so bad because he was malnourished and wasn't hydrated that he had to stop posing this last competition. You know, you put in all that work and then you have to leave because you can't even stand on stage and, and perform the, the poses. Um, and that's like not the accepted rule. That's pretty much the norm. Um, there's another competitor. Her calf was so swollen because of the electrolyte imbalance, they had to take a scalpel and cut her calf open to relieve the pressure. Like people die from this stuff and nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about the eating disorders in the bodybuilding space because it's not, it's not cool. You know, it's not, it's a weakness. They look at it as a weakness and it doesn't get you know, disclosed. So keto for natural bodybuilders especially, like this is the forefront, y'all. This is why I'm excited to be able to tap into this. Um, and we can go into the details, kind of like how I did this competition prep if y'all want to, but this is a quote I really like. I think it really resonates with the keto community as a whole. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. And that's what every single one of you in this room are doing right now. You're learning the unreasonable techniques, which it's funny because come back, look at it full circle. This is what we should all be doing from day one anyways. But you know, you look at large scale society and people look, you tell your kid about this like to your family and friends, they look at you like you're crazy, sucking down butter and stuff. But this is the forefront, this is cutting edge, y'all. Um, so you wanna be healthier with keto. Real quick, I, kind of the, the topic of my speech in its entirety is I want to be able to give you all the tools to improve your composition. Compositional changes with keto is kind of like my forte. It's my um, specialty, I guess. I've worked with a lot of clients. In working with a bunch of clients, I'm able to pattern recognition, see what they're having struggles with, and then be able to kind of give you all the tools you need to improve your own physique, composition, and health. So if you want to be healthier, the simple answer of it is eat keto from Whole Foods. You know, like Look at the ingredient labels and make sure that what you're eating is something you can pronounce. You know, if you've got like a freaking college essay on the back of your nutrition label, something's wrong. You know, this is, that's going to answer the 80-20 principle for you. You know, like the whole Pareto's law, 80%, I always say this wrong, but like 80% of your success from, comes from 20% of your 
Yeah, something like that, you know. You, you get the point. Um, so if you're wanting to get, improve your health, that's what it is. You're going to get 80% improvement just simply from eating keto from whole foods. You know, the quality foods you can get, that's going to make the majority of the difference. However, I'm a competitive bodybuilder. I'm an extremist. So I want to get unreasonable, tapping into that first quote there, and I want to optimize the next 20%. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about here. Um, so first things first. One thing that I see a lot of people struggle with, one common, common mistake that I see clients give me is they, they're wanting to, to build muscle and lose fat at the same time, which is great. I mean, who doesn't want to build muscle and lose fat at the same time? I want to build muscle and lose fat at the same time. And it can be done, but you're going to be shortchanging your progress if you try and do both simultaneously as you're both being your primary goal. Pick one primary goal, focus, double down on that, reach that goal, and then shift it to the next, make that next one your primary goal. You can, I just kind of give you an example. I mean, if your goal is to improve your composition, build muscle, and lose body fat, you can accomplish that in like two years time by just chipping away a little bit, little bit, little bit, or you could decide, okay, I'm gonna get super lean, I'm gonna lose the body fat that I want, get there, and then with keto, improve my composition, build muscle, and gradually, and then you're gonna look much better in a much shorter period of time, you're gonna be much healthier, and you're not gonna have to kind of short change your progress because you're trying to do two competing things. I mean. If you're trying to build muscle, you've got to give your body the, tissue, or the, the calories it needs to build that tissue. If you're trying to cut body fat, you're going to have to you know, take away a little bit so your body taps into its stored body fat. So don't have two conflicting goals going at the same time. Um, ratios, you know, macro ratios. Everybody's always asking about macro ratios. What is the best way to go about it? I get this question all the time from my clients on my Instagram, so I'm just going to dive into that hot and heavy right now. This is what I recommend doing. This is what I think y'all see the most success with. You know, taking a poll of all of my clients, this is what seems to work really well. Start with a higher fat percentage, right? You're on a ketogenic diet. I'm assuming most people in here are keto, wanting to do this with a keto percentage. You know, you always hear the whole 75-25 uh, ratio, and that's great. I encourage you to start at like 80% fat. When you're keto, fat becomes your primary fuel source. That is your, that's your energy, all right? So if you can kind of get a solid baseline at about 80% fat and then manipulate from there, you're going to give yourself a much better place to start from and kind of understand why your body responds the way it do. So I, I like to start about 80%. Determine protein threshold. So hypothetically speaking, one of y'all decides to work with me, and you can take this, these principles and apply them on yourself here. I'm going to start them at about 80% fat ratio. And then I'm going to slowly titrate their protein up while dropping their fat down, which is inherently going to increase their protein ratio. When you do that, you can tap into your own individual protein threshold. Everybody's going to be different. There's no like one set protein ratio, fat ratio. There's no grams that's perfect for everybody. So giving yourself a solid 80% fat ratio and then manipulating to find your protein threshold is key because that's going to be different for everybody. And that, you know, you might find your protein threshold when you start gaining weight, your weight starts plateauing, you start feeling poorly, start getting bloated. Um, make small adjustments to optimize. You know, I manipulate protein, fat, five grams at a time. I see some people, they just drop their calories by 500 gram or 500 calories all in a week. You know, at what point's the tipping point there? You can't catch it, you know, but if you make five gram adjustments week after week after week, you can be applying that constant pressure. That constant pressure is going to be what forces your body to adapt. That adaptation takes the form of that fat loss that you're looking for. All right, so this just kind of give you a visual this is what my chart looked like when I competed last year. This was the last couple of weeks of my contest prep. My carbs were 25, but I'm not going to lie. Most all of that was coming from Miracle Rice. I was keeping them in business. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I ate a lot of Miracle Rice. Uh, calories were at 1,600. Uh, again, total fat was 149. Protein was 67.75. So I got down to like 65 grams of protein. And like as a competitive bodybuilder, everybody else on the stage with me, they were like 300 grams of protein, but like 30 grams of fat. There was people literally cutting out fish oil pills to remove extra grams of fat. My fat was way up there. We're all backstage. They're eating rice cakes, and I'm eating freaking fat bombs, you know? There's a difference. Keto. Yeah, keto brick. Um, all right, so I just want to kind of dive into some of the questions. I know we're going to do a like Q&A, but I want to kind of give you all some like common pattern recognition stuff. This is what I see, and this is what you all can use going forward for yourself. Um, so do I need to have less fat? I'm trying to lose a lot of fat. 
I get that question a lot. People think they've got you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 or more pounds to lose. Why would they want to ingest more fat if they want to tap into their body's stored fat stores? And this is my theory. If you have a bunch of fat to lose and you have an 80% fat ratio, that's all you're giving it, your body's going to become incredibly efficient at using fat because that's what you're giving it. That's like what it's getting. You know, like it has to learn to adapt to use that. So then it becomes really efficient at using its own stored fat. And then as you chip away slowly with the caloric intake, applying that pressure, it's going to make your own stored fat melt away much more efficiently and you're going to feel much better along the process because you've got that higher fat ratio and your ketone production is through the roof. Um, more protein for better results. So this is a very controversial topic right now in the keto space. You got the carnivore keto, you got everybody wanting protein, one to one, three to one, two to one, what the hell, you know. <laughs> you, got, you got to figure out what is best for you, going back to the individual aspect thing. But when I was doing, you know, my bodybuilding competitions pre-keto, I was pretty much doing a really high protein ratio. And again, it's different because I wasn't keto adapted, but a lot of them, you know, they're doing, like a lot of competitors that aren't keto adapted, they wind up eating similar keto macros, except for their fat being so low, but their protein so high. And this is what happens. They start to feel like zombies because their fat's really low, their carbs are pretty low because they're like getting ready for a show, and their protein's sky high. So basically, what's happening is their body's inefficiently producing energy through gluconeogenesis because that's all they're giving it. You know, so they're, you're, I mean, that's a very inefficient process. Like, that's why they all walk around like zombies. That's why I manipulated protein down and kept my fat ratio high. Another controversial topic. Do calories matter? And the, the short of it is, it all matters. You know, hormones matter. Your sex matters. Your activity level matters. The foods you intake matters. Your metabolism matters. There's no, does it matter, does it not matter? Like, people talk about calories like, I can eat all the calories I want because it's all hormones. Or it's all genetics. You know, that's not true. If I eat 6,000 calories a day, I'm going to talk about that later, but I'm going to, I'm going to get fat, you know? Um, and the cool thing about calories is, that's one of the few things that you can fully manipulate. You know, I don't know how to plug in a macro or a track, a hormone tracker. How am I going to change my hormones? And I don't know how to do that, you know, but I can do my macros. I can do my calories and I can do the food that I'm putting in my mouth. I can change it. I can have full co coverage and control of what I'm doing. And I treat this like a scientific experiment. I want to have the variables that I manipulate. I want to remove as many variables as possible and double down on manipulating those that I can. Um, what about fiber? So I heard a really good analogy for fiber. A lot of people, I, I, keep, I keep carbs really low, like 10 grams of total carbs for my clients. Erwin's a client of mine, he's got 10 grams of total carbs right now. How's that working for you? Yeah, he's jacked, you know? <laughs> so a lot of people worry about fiber because I have them at so low. And, you know, you always hear you gotta have 25, 35, 45 grams of fiber. I heard a really good analogy. I think it's from, uh, I was listening to the obesity coat. And I agree and disagree with some of the things in there. But one thing he said about fiber that I really liked is, fiber is like the antidote for carbs. You know, if you have a lot of carbs, fiber acts as the antidote in lessening the negative effect of those carbs. But if I'm not eating hardly any carbs anyways, I don't need as much of an antidote. So therefore, I don't need as much fiber. And I keep my total carbs down below 10, 20 grams, depending on if I'm contest prep or off season. And I don't have a problem going to the bathroom, just saying. Um, so, did I miss one there? Electrolytes. Electrolytes, another good thing. Electrolytes, it, this kind of ties into the scale too. Everybody always wants to know about the scale fluctuation, you know, one pound here, two pound there, and it drives me crazy. You know, I'd like to weigh this, I like to use a scale, it's a tool, use that as data, use it as another valuable variable. But electrolytes, I mean, you can fluctuate three, four pounds overnight based off of electrolytes and water, and people let that freak them out. One time, I totally miscalculated how much sodium is in pink Himalayan salt. Does anybody know how much sodium is in pink Himalayan salt, roughly? Yeah, you look like you know, you know. No, it's about 500 milligrams per quarter teaspoon. I thought it was a tablespoon. I misread that. So I was eating 22,000 milligrams of salt one day, and I woke up 11 pounds heavier the next morning. I was pretty freaked out, you know? So don't do that. Don't do that. Electrolytes, you know, your sodium, your potassium, your water intake, they all share like a symbiotic relationship. It's like an equilibrium, you know? And I like to start clients, kind of depends on their activity level, how much they sweat, how much they weigh. But like for me, 4,000 milligrams of sodium, 2,000 milligrams of potassium, and about a gallon of water a day. Like a two to one ratio, you do that, it's a good solid baseline. And we can kind of go into, uh, you know, examples of good sources of potassium, but doing that is key. 
And it makes a huge difference. Like you get better muscle contractions when you're training. You get a better pump. You feel better. You have more like sharper mental synapses. And you're just on top of your game. And if people aren't salting their foods enough or drinking enough water or taking enough potassium, that's not going to happen. Oops, hit a button. All right, a couple more questions. What is the difference between men versus women? So lots of differences there. As it relates, <laughs> as it relates to compositional changes, one pattern that I've seen a lot is it takes women a little bit more time to see as much a fluctuation in the scale. Generally speaking, overall, that's one pattern that I've noticed. Crystal, for instance, I just took her through a contest prep and had her down to 30 grams of protein. She prepped for 22 weeks. She didn't see a, a change in a scale until, what, was it like? I think it was like nine weeks in. Nine weeks in. That's why when clients message me or anybody DMs me and they said, it's been a week and my scale hadn't changed. You don't know what you're talking about. I tell them to shut up, you know, <laughs> because she was doing that for nine weeks. And then, you know, with women, a lot of times you'll either see a front load or a back load on the change in the scale. And that's, she had the back load. So like stayed plateaued pretty much. And then all of a sudden the weight started dropping off and she got super lean. She got in a 13% body fat, which, you know, for a figure competitor, natural woman, that's, that's damn good. And same is true with guys, you know, like you might have, you know, not so much, it's, it's a little bit more linear, but there might be all kinds of sporadic trends in your weight. That's why it's key to take pictures, take measurements. If you have access to an in-body or DEXA or bod pod, use it because the scale alone is not a very good in indicating factor as to your progress. Um, does the quality of my food really matter? So I've literally had people say, I can't do keto because I can't afford grass-fed beef. Let that sink in for a second. You know, that's ridiculous. You know, you could literally eat keto. You know, if, you, if all you can afford is, you know, what's that potted meat stuff, that cat food, basically, spam? Yeah, I mean, that, the worst keto food is, is arguably better than the best carb-based food. You know, so don't, yeah, don't let yourself, don't postpone your progress and getting keto adapted simply because you can't afford grass-fed beef. I mean... Make options work. You can find options that are totally keto friendly, taste good, and we'll get the ticket done. Um, how should I train? A lot of people ask me about this. A lot of people want to, you know, lift heavy when they're trying to build muscle, and then they lift higher reps, lower weight when they're trying to cut. I encourage you to lift heavy as heavy as you can with good form, because when you lift heavy, kind of the same principle applies. You know, you're you're subjecting your body to stress. Your body has to adapt to that stress. If you're lifting heavy, it's going to tell your body, okay, I need to build the muscle to be able to adapt to this stressor. That I'm being subjected to. A lot of competitors that start lessening the weight and increasing the reps, their body sabotages their muscle that they've built and worked so hard for because they don't need that muscle anymore because they're not subjected to that stress. So lift heavy. Uh, supplements. I don't really take supplements, y'all. I'm not going to lie. I take my potassium, sodium, vitamin D, and creatine. That's pretty much it. A lot of people want to get all the cutting edge supplements. You know, that's another controversial topic. There's all kinds of ketone supplements coming out now. I'm going to put an emphasis on nutrition far and above supplements any day of the week. All right, so this is a, a kind of a new section of the slides that I didn't have last year. I think this honestly is even more important, and it's the, the, the really the, the catapulting factor is going to allow you to reach that next 20%, and it's all about changing the way you think. I could stand up here, I could tell you all all day long, like all kinds of tips and tricks on, you know, potassium supplements and ratios and macros on jazz, but if you don't have the right thought process, you're not going to get it done. So the first one, give yourself permission to kick some ass. And sorry for the foul language here, but so many people are not willing to put in the work and push themselves necessary to see their body change. And they ask why nothing's working. Like they'll, they'll, they'll not, and you don't have to, I'm not telling people to be a bodybuilder. Like if you don't, you don't have to be a bodybuilder if you don't want to be a bodybuilder. But if you have a goal in mind and you want to reach that goal and you're shorting yourself every single day because you don't want to feel the pain, you don't want to feel you know, like hard, you don't want to feel tired. I mean, push yourself, you know? Like the best things in life come after the hardest challenges. And that's the truth. That's everything I've ever, I mean, everything I've ever succeeded in life has come after a very hard trial. And the same is true with every competition prep. Like competition prep, bodybuilding, it's a metaphor for life. So no matter what your chosen sport is, no matter what your, your passion is, work hard at it. Have a long game approach. All right, so again, this kind of goes back to people wanting to take shortcuts in life. But when I'm, I'm excited 
this is what I'm excited about, y'all. Ketogenic diet is, is on the rise, and like Google Trends are going up crazy. Everybody's wanting the next cutting edge thing. You know, these salts and supplements that are going to make you like freaking jacked in a week. You know, eat burgers, drink this. Look, be, you've been keto in 24 hours, 60 minutes even. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll get that reference. Um, I'm excited for what I'm looking like when I'm 75 years old. I'm going to be the most jacked 75 ketogenic natural bodybuilder here. And I'll be speaking with gray hairs, and I'm excited about that because this is a long game way of living. You know, this is the long game approach. Like, don't focus on tomorrow. Focus on the lifestyle. You know, everything's got a compounding effect, whether it's your finances, your relationship, your business endeavors, your body. You know, your body is your fortress. So give it what it needs, build it correctly with a strong foundation day after day, year after year, and you can't go wrong. Make your lifestyle symbiotic. All right, so a lot of people struggle because they've got. X that competes with Y and they want both, kind of going back to that two primary goal thing, try and build a life for yourself that builds each, you know, each part simultaneously. Like when I built this business, Keto Savage, when I built this lifestyle, I sat down, I went out in the woods and asked myself, I, I backtracked, okay, I desired, I imagined my most desired life and then I worked backwards from that. What can I build that makes everything work in a symbiotic nature? so that I can continue to improve everything without having to distract from the other. And that's really important. It's easier said than done, but try and think in terms of that. You know, how can your nutrition, how can your training, how can your relationships all work in, symbiotic, in a symbiotic way to build each other as they grow? And then add more value than you take. You know, the cool thing about social media these days and is that you can, just, you can reach so many more people. You can scale the reach that you have. Like, there's doctors here right now, like Dr. Kim Berry, he's got like a huge YouTube following. He's able to impact so many more people with that than he could on one-on-one -on -one patient consultations that come into his office. Every one of you have a phone. Every one of you has the ability to reach somebody at scale. You know, we're on the cutting edge here, y'all. We are on the cutting edge. And this is a grassroots movement. It's not going to come from the top. We're not going to have, you know, the Arkansas Heart the Association, not Arkansas, but the American Diabetes Association says in, Eat keto. We're not going to get that, you know. It's going to come from us working from the ground up. So leverage this opportunity. Leverage the opportunity that you have in front of you to, to make a difference. You know, that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited about pumping out a daily YouTube video or jumping on a podcast or spreading the word through my social media. I'm excited to see y'all do it because this is how we're going to change a cultural shift that's going to improve the health and, of our society as a nation. So do that. That's pretty much all I got. I don't know how much time that was. We got time for Q and A's, I'm assuming, right? Anybody got any questions? We can go into the specifics on like actual contest prep stuff or dining stuff if y'all want. Okay, so you said that you supplement with you said sodium, potassium, and creatine. Mm -hmm. You, I assume that you also still recommend creatine for females. Yeah, creatine's really good. I mean, creatine's been, and sometimes I'm bad about taking it, but creatine's been you know, uh, uses a supplement since, like, really heavily since the 70s. So it's been really, really well researched. It was around long before, like, whey protein powders was. And, I mean, it helps convert ADP back into ATP, which is basically, like, the energy molecule of the cell. And it also works in the brain. You know, so the same thing it's doing in the, in the muscle tissue is also going on in the brain. So it's a safe supplement. The main thing with it is just drink it enough. I mean, you have to, I mean don't get, like, a flavored one. Just get, like, a simple, like, micronized monohydrate creatine, drink enough water, and just drink consistently so that your body stays saturated with it. But then, yeah, you do that, you're good to go. I don't know who else, who's next here? A couple over there. If you're in a muscle building phase, what about meal timing in order to help with the protein mus or muscle building synthesis and things like that? Great question. So meal time, it's honestly one of the beauties of keto. Like it's, it's kind of liberating. Before, when I was on a traditional bodybuilding bro diet, I would eat every two and a half, three hours, six, seven times a day. Literally, I'd be lugging around like Tupperwares like crazy. I don't do that anymore. I eat twice a day and I just increase the calories in that meal. Like if I'm eating, like within a 24-hour period, your body's not really going to you know, preferentially choose, you know, your meals. You don't have to worry about it. You know, eat enough to build, have enough of a surplus to build more tissue, 
But like I said, I eat two meals a day. Like if I'm in a building phase, I'll just increase the calories in those meals. I think he's going to give you a microphone there. <laughs> you sound wonderful, by the way. Um, so I, hello, um, I watched your videos with Keto Connect, which was awesome, by the way. Um, you. you guys did like a refeed, mm -hmm. and I didn't really understand the concept of that. So can you talk about the refeed? And Because I obviously Googled it, but I feel like it's different for a keto diet. Yep. Um, and when you would want to do it and basically why. So a keto, I call them keto caloric refeeds. Like you say refeed and most people assume you're talking about carbs. Like I'm going to do cyclical keto, basically eat a bunch of carbs on my refeed. That's not what I advocate. Mine are keto caloric refeeds. So they're effective towards the latter part of a contest prep when your body's depleted, you're at a very low caloric intake and your body's starting to kind of stall a little bit because like you're, you're in those poverty macros is what we call them. So I'll introduce a keto caloric refeed, and I'll kind of manipulate a little bit with these because it can be different for everybody, but I'll start at about a 30% increase in calories um, coming from fats and protein. And what that's going to do is it's going to kind of jumpstart your metabolism, jumpstart, give your hormones a little breather, and it's just going to trigger a change because it's just something so different. Like you've been chipping away at your calories and your macros have been steady consistent for like three, four, five, six months. Having that refeed in there to kind of like totally shock the body is going to do several things. Oftentimes just kind of get you out of that stall. I'll use them specifically to peak for like on the stage, like when I'm competing, and I'll, you know, rather than filling out my glycogen stores with carbs, I'll fill out with proteins and fats. Like my body's just gonna soak all that up and I'll fill out more and I'll increase the sodium a little bit and that extra sodium draws any water into the cell instead of the subcutaneous layer of skin and it makes my skin look more paper thin, it brings up more vascularity, it allows me to look a little bit better for the stage specifically. I, I can hear you. I don't know if they I mean, need it. No, I got you. Um, so I was just curious because your question. So um, if you're just trying to like I'm not a trying to like build muscle, lean muscle, what is your thoughts around intermittent fasting or fasting 36 hours, 48 hours? Do you have any thoughts around if that affects? So fasting, there's like two concepts of fasting that I that I incorporate. One is just to kind of keep insulin at bay. By doing, and you can do that like kind of with a fat fast, like not really having high glycemic index carbs. Another is like the, the true fasting, like the water fasting, when the primary goal is like, you know, cell autophagy and kind of apoptosis and really just kind of, you know, cell turnover basically. Um, so like kind of a different goal. I wouldn't probably recommend constant fasting if the primary goal is to build muscle. But if like I want to incorporate more for that very reason, you know, cell autophagy. So in a building phase, what I would probably do is have like a, like a, like how long are you thinking extended fast, fast usually? Uh, to me, 36 is like a, a 36? 48 was hard. Like 48 was hard? So if your primary goal is to build, if you do that fast, like on a monthly or bi-monthly basis, but then the rest of the time you're in enough of a caloric surplus to build muscle, then yeah, it, it's kind of a wash. Like you'll, it's a good thing. Like you'll be able to still build muscle. Yeah, yeah. You do how much? Yeah, once a week, I probably wouldn't do that because that's just, yeah, once a month or even bi monthly, like kind of titrate it off a little bit. And you're still going to get a lot of the benefits from a cell turnover standpoint, but you're not really going to sabotage your muscle building standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so, from a nutritional and, and training perspective, what's, you know, um, What's the process for switching from a you know from a cut to a to a, a build sort of phase uh, in keto, especially for somebody who's never done it before? Yeah, yeah, good question. So, like, at what point do you change your priorities? You know, like if you if you're happy with how you look now, you don't feel like you're holding on to any extra fat, you don't feel like you need to get leaner, then focus on building. Like, I don't like the word maintenance. Like to me, maintenance is like stagnant. You know, why do I want to just maintain where I'm at? I want to get better. You know, so like if you're happy with where you're at, with where you're at com compositionally from like a leanness perspective, then focus on eating a little bit more, building a little bit more muscle. When you do that, be okay with the fact that you might put on a little bit of fat because you're going to be, you know, at a surplus. If you want to get a little bit leaner in order to build confidence or like just kind of see your abs again, then then get leaner and then focus on on building. But yeah, just it's honestly like personal preference. Like all all in 
where you're confident, where you're happy. You know, like if you want to get leaner, get leaner, then focus on building. If you want to just, if you're happy with where you're at, just focus on building. You know? Bye. Let's say we did a 16 8 fast. Um, I work out just before, just at the end of the 16 fast, and then feed my body twice a day, like you suggested. Is that, is that? Yeah, that's totally fine, I think. I mean, like on a daily basis, like, because you're getting enough calories in throughout the course of 24 hours. So as long as you're in a surplus, you'll be able to build for sure. I mean, what, what she was doing, she was doing like an extended, you know, three days fast. Like, I don't want to do a heavy leg day and then go three days without eating because that's just going to kind of result in more muscle damage than growth um, based off the research currently. So, yeah, I would, I would do, I mean, that's totally fine, though. And when you're building, you do, uh, obviously, your heavy lifting. Do you integrate any kind of high intensity or any kind of cardio one day a week? Yeah, I th I'm a big fan of cardio because I think, I mean, cardiovascular strength and stamina is only going to improve your ability to lift heavy weights. Like if I'm doing squats, for instance, and I can lift 450 pounds once because I've got poor cardiovascular strength, or if I have, you know, I do cardio more often, I, could, I have better stamina, and I can lift that same 455 pounds, you know, two, three, four times, then that's only going to help with muscle growth. Can we talk about um, the, how low? You need the microphone too, Crystal. Not really a question for myself, but I feel like a lot of people will take this conversation that you or this talk that you had and take their calories really low. So can you talk about how low not to go or when to kind of kind of stop? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. Good question. A lot of clients will come and they they're like at 900 calories. What do you do? I mean, when you're at 900 calories, you have nowhere left to go. Like you're bottomed out. And when you do that, I mean you're totally shortchanging your process. What you have to do at that point, I like to call it onboarding, or like, yeah, basically onboarding. Basically, we have to increase your body's, you know, caloric intake so that we can repair your metabolism, repair your hormones, and that may take, I mean, nobody wants to do that. Like, if you're at 900 calories and you want to lose weight, the last thing you want me to tell you is, okay, I need you to eat a lot more. You may put on some body fat, but uh, that's what you got to do because kind of like that, that short-term way of thinking. But if you do that, I mean, if you increase your calories, reset your metabolism, reset your hormone, give yourself more runway to taper from later, then you're setting yourself up for success for the long haul. And then you can repair that and be able to, to maintain or sustain dieting you know, for the long term. But if you're at 900 calories, then you're really just, you're, you're screwing up your system internally. And that's so common, especially females. You know, I don't see too many men that low, but a lot of females that go that low. And like their body's just not going, I mean, your body's smart. Like it wants to survive, like it's evolved to survive. And if you're starving yourself, your body, the last thing it's gonna do is give up more fat because it wants that, because it needs it to survive. Lots of questions. Right. We got one here, we got one behind you. We got one right there. <laughs> Uh, you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but just to go into a little more depth on it, I'm an MPC competitor, not natural. Um, I mean, I am natural, but in that mm -hmm. NPC, we do water loading, kind of what you were saying, depleting the whole thing. What's your protocol for, for doing keto instead of doing the water loading, or would you take and stand in water? This is, this, what, is, what it, that, this is cool. This is really cool. I'm glad you asked this. So this is a very <laughs> bodybuilding specific question, but it's interesting. So like a lot of people that are on carbs, they'll cut the water, they'll low water, and what they're doing there is they're trying to dry themselves out, and then right there at the end, they'll load it up to force more, you know, like let, let, let their muscles mm -hmm. fill out, their cells fill out. But with keto, since you don't have like one gram of glycogen, which is what you get when you're eating carbs, holds about three grams of water. And competitors that don't do that right, like you, you probably know some, they don't do that right, they'll spill over is what we call it. Mm -hmm. And they'll look super flat because they don't have any definition because they have too much water and it's all just sitting in their subcutaneous layer of skin. You can't see any definition. The cool thing about keto is that since you don't have the carbs, you don't have the glycogen. So you don't have to manipulate the water. So I literally was drinking a gallon of water before I stepped on stage when everybody else was sipping on eight-ounce glasses, mm -hmm. you know, because I didn't have to yeah. worry about that. Yeah, that, that was me. I, my last company, you're on SIP status, basically. Yeah, so yeah. Called. And see, you could do keto mm -hmm. and not have to do that. And you could stay yeah, hydrated. Yeah, well, I am keto. And I'm on my prep right now. My prep uh, is coming to an end, and I'm just thinking about show day. My coach, he has me, uh, he's doing a keto, but I don't 
believe he really knows keto, so I'm doing my own keto. There's a lot of them out there. <laughs> I, I'm doing my own keto, and so my concern is show day or that last week where we do water loading. Which when is your show day? Do. In August. In August? Um, supposed to be July, but I just pushed it back because I want to make sure I am definitely ready. And that's my concern is just I'm not going to follow the whole water loading process. Yeah, don't. I'm going to do it myself. So I was just wondering if you have any advice of like you said about um, increasing sodium. So like let's say you said 4,000 milligrams of sodium normal a day. Mm -hmm. So then would I uh, a day before or two days before? What, what is your, 5, what is your, are you tracking your sodium now? Do you know what you are now? Um, right now I'm only at like three thirty five. Hundred maybe three thousand milligrams. So I would probably bump it up on the day before, like when you do your refeed keto refeed, bump it up to like forty five hundred or five thousand, mm -hmm. and then um, kind of like make. I would test that out a few weeks before though, like yeah, try and do a couple I was trial runs. Try to do yeah. actually. Actually, get it. with me afterwards, um, mm -hmm. and I'll kind of develop like a peak week strategy. I don't want to go around your coach's back or anything, yeah. but I'll work with you. Well, see, that's what I know, and I feel bad because I'm like, okay, I I, I trust my coach, I believe in that, mm -hmm. but at the same time. If he doesn't know, there's then not he doesn't very know. Many, uh, yeah. Competitors, so there's not very much experience. So I, I would rather, you know. Yeah, and, and if they some... if they try and instill like carb based technique when mm -hmm. you're keto, like that's it does, a disaster. Don't you don't want work. that. Yeah, yeah, I don't. I don't believe so. So I yeah. want to do it the right way, the keto way, because I am keto. I just feel like I'm, that's the whole. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll talk. I'll get yeah. you fixed up okay, for sure. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Next question. Yeah, one. In your front, one in the back. I was glad to hear um, that you uh, like cardio because that's actually more my wheelhouse. Um, and so my question is, I, I noticed there is a physiological difference in how I feel and like how I can tweak my macros between when I lift weights or when I'm doing endurance training, running, training for a marathon or a 5K or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so would you change your approach um, like or how you would coach a client or how you would uh, advise people to approach their keto and um, how they would feed themselves basically in bodybuilding versus more endurance activity, cardio activity, that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the principles are going to be the same, but like it kind of goes down to the individual basis. Like I've got, I've got endurance athletes, clients of mine that respond really well to the same principles that I put on my, you know, competitive bodybuilding clients. Um, the main thing is just like consistency. Like if there's a whole lot of variability and like your macros from training days and non-training days and they're just like harder, it's harder to like nail down what's affecting what. But if you like eat consistent macros, change them like on a weekly basis, make small changes. And even like with carbs, you might have a higher protein threshold. You might have a lower protein threshold or higher carbs or lower carbs. You know, like some endurance athletes can probably tolerate a little bit higher carb threshold, but not much. Like a lot of people, like I say that, and it's going to get me in trouble because they're going, all right, 50, 60 grams of carbs. You know, like not the case. Um, but yeah, I mean, I let, let yourself, you know, stay pretty consistent on a weekly basis and make small changes. And then you can really fine tune that for your sport. And then, yeah, I mean, the rest is history because you'll be able to optimize for that. Um, when you talk about like reverse dieting or onboarding before the cut, mm -hmm. does that actually give you the ability to like increase the number of calories that your body maintains at, or what's Absolutely. the main purpose? Absolutely. Yeah, like when you when you decrease your calories, it's inevitable that your body's metabolism is going to slow down a little bit. When you increase your calories, the reverse is true. You have to kind of like hedge your bets and do so safely and sustainably. I mean, your your metabolism is going to change like as you're changing what you're giving your body. Like, that's like your body's evolved to do that. So you want to make sure you give yourself enough of a runway, enough of a threshold to allow yourself to, even when it fluctuates from one end of the spectrum to the other, it's still healthy. You know, so like if you onboard, your metabolism is going to increase a little bit. And when you offboard or when you cut down, it's going to decrease a little bit. But as long as you've started a higher caloric intake, when you decrease, it's still going to be, even as it's slow, it's still going to be like in a healthy, sustainable range. You know, that's, that's so, so important. We got a few minutes left. Any other questions? Many other questions. Just because I was texting someone about what you're talking about. For refeeds, um, do you to help? I mean, I think I heard you say it can help with the stall. Mm -hmm. Do you have a suggestion of how often or how long that refeed period needs to be? So what I find works really well is I'll do like like for instance with regard to my show. My show's on Saturday. I'll do the refeed on Friday, and I'll pretty much 
bulk the most majority of those macros in one meal and it'll be towards the end of my day which is going to really impact how I feel the next morning and I'll be able to really fine tune like focusing on how I feel the next morning is going to let me know how effective that refeed was whereas if I like spread it out throughout the whole day or like multiple days then I don't really know how effective it was because there's too much variability but if I eat and the majority of those macros in that last meal the next morning it's like really good immediate real-time feedback we got one minute. One question for one minute. You got one right there. There's the winner. How are you doing? Um, I don't know if this is on. Oh, it's on. Okay. Um, so I'm an ex uh, bodybuilder turned competitive CrossFitter. Um, so I started it back in September, thinking that you know I could start keto from a performance advantage. So from a pure strength standpoint, keto was it, right? I was stronger. But the reality is, is where I started to suffer, and I noticed it when I went back into the CrossFit Open this year, um, is that high volume gymnastics suffered dramatically, right? Because my musculature was, was higher, but I just didn't feel like I had enough in the tank to support that. So do you have any experience with, with um, competitive CrossFit athletes? And if so, what, what have you done? How long have you been keto in, in your entirety? Uh, September of last year. September of last year, okay. Yep. This is a really, really, really good question, y'all. Yep. So really pay attention here. And this, this bleeds over into lots of areas of keto. This is why I partnered up with Keto Connect and made the course Deeper State Keto. Like deeper State being the primary mean, meaning here. When you are in a keto adapted state for a very long period of time, that is much, much different than being keto adapted for six months. So like producing ketones and being in ketosis is not the same thing as being keto and fat adapted. I've been keto for four years strict, no carb meals. That's, I feel so much different now than I did after six months of keto, even though my ketone uh, readings you know, may be pretty similar. In your case, you know, having that variability in training style, I'd be willing to, I'd put money on it. If you stay strict keto, this is like that long game, nobody wants to hear this. Yeah. You know, you stay keto strict without any crazy carb meals, yeah. really fine tune, optimize your body, you know, one year, two year, three year, four year, you're gonna be a freaking machine in CrossFit or whatever your sport is. Like you give your body the time it takes to get fully adapted and make this your thing, then everything improves. That's all she wrote.